Last time we spoke about stratospheric aerosol delivery using artillery. Today we're going to speak about another method of delivery, this time using rockets. First, we'll recap the rationale of solar radiation management by stratospheric aerosol delivery. Then, the main part of the lecture will be about rocket engines and how to design them. This will, be, this will cover specific impulse, gas dynamics in nozzles, and the choice of fuel that could be used in rocket engines. We'll finish by working through some examples together. So let's recap what we said before about solar radiation management. So we've mentioned the global target of 1.5 to 2 Celsius uh, and this target was agreed at the COP21 uh, conference uh, in Paris 2015 where 195 leaders of nearly all the countries in the world did in fact uh, converge on these targets but um, these are actually very onerous targets so in order to achieve these we would actually need to reach a peak of emissions very, very soon, perhaps as soon as 2020. Uh, and then we would need to reduce emissions very quickly after that. So if we want to achieve these targets by the conventional means or the currently discussed means of just reducing emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, it's actually going to be quite difficult. So is there a plan B? Well, yes, there are uh, uh, plan Bs, and they basically fall in two main categories. The first category is carbon dioxide reduction, CDR, and the second category, which is what we're talking about today, is solar radiation management, SRM. Basic principle of solar radiation management is simple we're going to try to shade the earth from the incoming sun rays. So it's just like a sunshade on the beach, if you like, but implemented at a huge scale. So uh, there are different concepts of doing this, but one of the most discussed concepts is using aerosols in the atmosphere, or specifically in the stratosphere. So aerosols in the stratosphere can reflect sunlight back to space. Uh, we recall that the stratosphere is a relatively stable area of the atmosphere above the Earth's weather system. So um, aerosols uh, uh, there would tend to persist for a long time. And there are numerous chemicals that can be used to form these kinds of aerosols that can reflect the sun rays back to space, uh, especially sulfates. So uh, compounds of sulfur, sulfur dioxide, um, hydrogen sulfur sulfide injected to the stratosphere can form sulfates which are actually very good at encouraging the formation of aerosols which are good at reflecting sunlight back to space. The quantities of sulphur that will be needed are large but not necessarily prohibitive. To give an idea of the quantity required, Let's compare the amount of sunlight we need to reflect to counteract the increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases currently taking place. In previous sessions, we've already spoken about radiative forcing. Radiative forcing refers to the increase in downward radiation experienced due to buildup of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. A doubling of carbon dioxide concentrations gives a radiative forcing of about 4 watts per meter squared and this could be offset by reflecting about 1.8% of solar radiation. According to the Royal Society report that we looked at, that may require something like 1.5 to 5 million tonnes of sulphur to be injected into the atmosphere each year. Sure, that's a large amount but it's at least a thousand times less than the, than the amount of carbon we're injecting into the atmosphere, which is something like 6 billion tonnes per year. So, the engineering challenge is about how to lift these large quantities of sulphur or sulphur compounds at least 10 kilometres vertically and deliver them to the stratosphere. Today, we're going to talk about doing this using rockets.
So what exactly are we going to learn in today's session? We're going to learn about designing rockets for stratospheric delivery. And for that purpose, there are three things we need to learn how to do. First, we need to be able to design a rocket engine to provide desired specific impulse. And I'll be talking about the meaning of this term specific impulse. Then we're going to learn about different fuels for use in rocket engines. Finally, we'll bring together this information and the material that we learned last year to learn about calculating flight time and range for rockets as used for stratospheric delivery. Before we get started, let's make sure we've got clear in our minds basic ideas about what a rocket engine is and how it works. So the basic idea of a rocket engine is actually very simple. Rocket fuel burns, creating high temperature and pressure in a combustion chamber. As a result, hot gases, also called propellants, are formed. They escape from one end of the chamber at high velocity, downwards. As a result, um, a thrust is created. So we could say that a force is needed to accelerate these gases, and the reaction to this force creates a thrust, which is what propels the rocket upwards. Okay, so a rocket is a simple device. Let's just point out a couple of basic uh, facts about rockets. First of all, they're different from jet engines, which is the engine we would normally have in an aeroplane, in that they have to carry all their fuel with them. Okay, so all the fuel and the propellants uh, of the rocket has to be carried with it. A rocket doesn't suck in any air at all. So it can travel through a vacuum, for example, which a jet engine can't. Uh, what rockets are really good for is for creating a large thrust over a short period of time. So here are a couple of examples of rocket engines. So the first modern rocket engine was invented during the Second World War and uh, it was uh, incorporated in the German V2 rocket, which was a weapon uh, used by the Germans towards the end of that war. That invention evolved into the NASA Saturn V rocket um, some 25 years later. Here we have a picture of the Apollo, Apollo 10 which has a Saturn V rocket um, which burnt kerosene. Just to illustrate what I said about the very large power and thrust produced over a relatively short period of time, this type of rocket, which is the type of rocket that took astronauts to the moon, produced a thrust of 33,000 kilonewtons during liftoff over a period of 168 seconds. So that's a thrust enough to lift about 3,000 tons of mass off the ground, but it only lasts for just under three minutes. So now we're going to talk about specific impulse. So we need to get clear in our minds uh, ideas about impulse, force, time and momentum. The basic idea is that impulse is, a, is equal to a force acting on a body multiplied by the time for which the force acts. And when you have a certain impulse it corresponds to a certain increase in momentum of the body that the force acts on. So if you have a body in a vacuum in space, let's say you give it a certain amount of impulse, its in momentum will increase by that same amount. Now specific impulse is force times time, that's impulse, divided by the mass of fuel provided to create that impulse. So the reason that we like to use specific impulse to describe rockets is there's a very good criterion of performance for a rocket because it tells us how much thrust we get in and how much, over how much time, so how much impulse we get in relation to the amount of uh, the mass of propellant supplied to the rocket. So we could always increase this specific imp the impulse 
by providing more mass in a more powerful rocket, but that would make the rocket heavier. So what we really want in a rocket is a lot of thrust action acting for a long time without using a lot of mass to create it. So the ideal situation will be to have infinite thrust for infinite time with zero mass of propellant. And the nearer we can get to that, the better. You'll see that specific impulse is measured simply in units of meters per second. So specific impulse um, actually has two components corresponding to two components of thrust that are provided to a rocket. The first, the first component is called the momentum thrust and it's equal to the mass flow of propellant issuing from the rocket times their exit velocity. So it's the rate at which momentum is created in the propellant leaving the rocket. This creates a corresponding thrust. The second component is called pressure thrust. This takes into account that at the exit of the rocket nozzle, the propellants might not be at atmospheric pressure. Generally, they'd be slightly higher than atmospheric pressure, creating a pressure thrust. So to work out the pressure thrust, we have to, work, we have to multiply the exit area of the nozzle by the difference between the exit pressure and atmospheric pressure, and that gives us a, a thrust in newtons. However, in most practical rockets, the momentum thrust is much larger than the pressure thrust. And we'll see this in the examples later on, but the pressure thrust might only be about a tenth of the momentum thrust, let's say. So we can turn this expression into a corresponding expression for specific impulse. We just have to multiply by the, the force by time and divide by the mass that's being supplied and we can also think that mass of propellant divided by time over which this um, propulsion occurs is simply equal to m dot which is the mass flow of the rocket propellant. So when do we divide the above expression by m dot we get this which is a very important expression to describe um, the specific impulse of any rocket. Okay, so I think you should remember this expression because it's very fundamental. So it's also quite simple and it tells us that if what we said before is true and the momentum term is the dominant term, all we're really interested in or what we're mostly interested in is maximize maximizing the velocity of the propellants, that's the term u at the exit of the, of, of the rocket. The larger u is, the larger the specific impulse we'll get, the more force we'll be able to provide over a longer time whilst not having to use a large mass of fuel. It would be expensive to use a large mass of fuel in a rocket, especially since we're going to have to carry that mass of fuel with us and accelerate it. Uh, which will provide energy, which would require energy in itself. So, in order to achieve large velocities, we generally find that at rocket, uh, in rocket engines, supersonic velocities are used. Okay, so velocities at the exit of rocket engines uh, exceed the speed of sound. So, how do we achieve these supersonic velocities? Well, we use a supersonic nozzle, otherwise known as a Laval nozzle. So the characteristic feature of a supersonic nozzle is that, it ha is that it has both a contracting and then an expanding section. So this is the contracting section and this is the expanding or divergent section. Pressure changes are large in this kind of nozzle, okay? So they're not negligible. We wouldn't be able to assume that the density of the gas is constant. It changes a great deal fact the density of the gas decreases as it flows through the nozzle from left to right. Okay now as a gas accelerates larger velocity tends to mean that you need a smaller area so if we look at this e e equation for continuity for example if the density were constant a larger velocity would mean a smaller area 
okay? Because the mass flow at every point in the nozzle must be the same. So that's true to some extent in a supersonic nozzle, but it's only actually true in the convergence section. At the throat of the nozzle, the gas acquires the speed of sound, and it's possible to show, and we'll see this later, that beyond the speed of sound, the variation in density takes over such that the density decreases more rapidly than the velocity is increasing. As a result, the area actually has to increase in order to accommodate the mass flow of propellant okay, in the divergence section of the nozzle. One point to note is that in the analysis of nozzles, uh, we have a combustion chamber. So you can imagine this is a rocket, this being the combustion chamber of the rocket. And the combustion chamber is usually sufficiently large compared to the nozzle of the rocket that we'd assume the velocity here to be stagnant. So we define stagnation conditions in the combustion chamber as PS and TS. So now we're going to analyse flow in the supersonic nozzle to see how the properties of the gas vary according to the position in the nozzle. In order to do so, we're going to make some assumptions. First of all, we're going to assume constant properties across any section of the nozzle. So it's just a one-dimensional analysis whereby um, we're only going to analyze how a property is varying in this direction because we're going to assume that properties in this transverse direction are always constant. We'll apply again the equation of continuity, which is what we used before. We'll also apply the steady flow energy equation. Um, this equates um, the energy carried by the gas, any position, um, as being equal to the energy at a different position. That's to say the total energy of the gas doesn't change, or rather it's uh, uh, <coughs> and that's because we're assuming that effectively there's no heat loss from the nozzle. So you could think of this as being an insulated nozzle if you like, but in any case heat losses would be relatively small. Um, so the steady flow energy equation in this, uh, in this case neglects the potential energy, so gravity uh, terms are considered insignificant. So we've got a temperature term which corresponds to the enthalpy of the gas, temperature multiplied by specific heat capacity at constant pressure. Uh, we've got a velocity term representing the kinetic energy. Note there's no velocity term on the left of the equation. That's because um, we're talking here about stagnation conditions. So it's assumed that velocity conditions inside the combustion chamber are, are uh, effectively stagnant. Um, we're also going to apply the adiabatic gas law, so hopefully you're familiar with this um, expression PV to the gamma equals constant, which applies to isentropic, uh, reversible and adiabatic expansion of gas. Uh, and combining that with the ideal gas law, you can arrive at these relations to show how the properties of uh, a gas expanding adiabatically, so without any heat um, exchange, uh, will vary. And it's all um, expressed as ratios to the stagnation conditions, as indicated by the subscript S. Um, finally, we'll make use of the basic relations among constants and specific heat capacities. So when we work this through, we actually end up with, and this is left as an exercise, exercise number three for you to do on your problem sheet, is we end up with these dimensionless, ex dimensionless expressions which uh, relate directly to the velocity, this one relates to the velocity, and this one relates to the area, well, it's one over area, okay? So remember that TS, it will be a constant for our rocket because it, it's, it's, it's just the conditions in the, stagnant, in, in, in the combustion chamber, so it won't vary along here because it's, it's, it's constant, uh, constant condition for the combustion chamber. So the velocity is referenced to um, square root of RTS, where R is the gas constant, and it expresses, expresses the velocity in terms of pressure ratio, um, uh, ratio of pressure, uh, uh, again, relative to the stagnation condition, and the um, index gamma keeps uh, cropping up. That's the ratio of specific capacity in a slightly complicated way um, in these kind of expressions. And this is a similar expression for the area parameter. Okay, But it's all in terms of just this one variable, pressure ratio. 
So the pressure ratio must relate somehow to the position in the nozzle. So let's present that graphically. So these expressions can be slightly intimidating, but they're not really uh, uh, anything complicated. They just describe these simple curves. Um, and I've um, drawn these curves using a value, a value of gamma equals 1.2, which is quite a typical value for the type of gases and propellants that we might have in a rocket engine. Now, on this diagram, the pressure ratio starts off at 1 and decreases this way to 0. So this is actually the case of, this is the situation in the combustion chamber before the gases started to expand. So if I want to superimpose my diagram of the rocket nozzle on this diagram, um, it will have to be the other way around, okay? And the throat here corresponds to the minimum area of the nozzle. And in fact, this is where the speed of the, of the gas becomes, um, so, uh, becomes uh, reaches the velocity of sound. So at this side, it's supersonic. At this side, it's sonic. Here, it's just at the speed of sound. And uh, there's an exercise on your problem sheet whereby you can verify that is the case. Okay, so now we're going to illustrate how to use these equations and curves to solve a practical problem in rocket design. So please take a look at example 5 or exercise 5 on your problem sheet. Um, we're given some parameters and you're asked to work out other parameters. So the parameters you've given are the conditions in the combustion chamber of the rocket as 3000 Kelvin and 10 bar pressure. Are you told that gamma is equal to 1.2? Okay, so that's convenient because it's the same as what we've got drawn here. Uh, R is 461.5 joules per kilogram Kelvin. So that's the gas constant for a particular gas. It's not the universal gas constant. Okay, so it turns out that's a gas constant which corresponds to the property of water vapor or steam. So it seems like this is probably a rocket burning hydrogen oxygen. Um, now, we've been told that we need to achieve an exit velocity of 2,000 meters per second and a thrust of 250 kilonewtons. And we've been asked to find the ratio of exit area to throat area, the specific impulse of the rocket, the mass flow of propellants, and the exit area of the nozzle. So we're going to use this chart to do just that. So we start off with the uh, looking at the velocity that we're asked to achieve. That's um, velocity of 2,000 meters per second. Working back from that, we can work out the velocity parameter. Okay, u over square root of RTS. Okay, so we're given R, uh, and we would tend to know that because it's just a property of the gas, and we're given uh, stagnation temperature in the combustion chamber. So simply dividing u by square root of R over TS, we get a velocity parameter as 1.7. Okay, so Drawing a, look, a line across to the graph, uh, the curve for that parameter, and dropping down to the pressure ratio axis, we see that the pressure ratio in this case is 0.2. Now we can make use of the other parameter we've got, which is the error parameter. Now remember that in the expression for the error parameter, everything is constant except the area. Mass flow through a nozzle must be constant at all points along the nozzle, and these are the stagnation conditions. So, if this changes, is it because the area has changed proportionately? Just remembering that area um, uh, appears in the denominator, so where this curve is maximum is where the area is minimum. We can easily get then from this area parameter curve the ratio of exit area to throat area because we've got a uh, corresponding ratio of uh, this parameter. So, for 0.2 pressure ratio, we've got 0.43 and for the pressure ratio corresponding to the peak of that curve, we've got 0.65. So what we need to do is divide 0.65 by 0.43 to get the ratio of areas as 1.51. Okay, so now we're going to work out specific impulse. Okay, so now we're going to work out the specific impulse, and for this we use the same equation that we had before. So this is the equation that I mentioned that we should know, because it's basic for all rockets. So it tells us that the specific impulse has two terms, one corresponding velocity and momentum, and the second term corresponding to the pressure. Now the first term, in fact we already know, because it's just the exit velocity of the rocket, which was a parameter given in the, pressure, in the question. 
What we don't immediately know is this second term, but it's not too difficult to work out. We just have to rearrange the equation a bit, and I'll show you how to do that. So that's what we need to do. All I've done is rearrange this equation so we can uh, separate out this term, which is in fact the area parameter we saw before. In fact, it's 1 over the area parameter. Uh, to cancel the denominator of that, I've multiplied by the square root of RTS, which is, again, a pair of constants. To cancel PS, I've divided by PS here, um, uh, which um, gives it, me an expression that's um, algebraically identical to that, except that I know everything I need to know here, because P over PS is the uh, pressure ratio, which I got off the graph before, and I got the error parameter off the graph before. So if I put in all the values I need, okay, so 1 over the error parameter of 0.43, as seen on the, pre on the previous slide, gives me 2.32. Um, that's um, from the constants given in the question. Uh, 0.2 is again from the graph that we looked at before. And 1 over 10, well, it was given in the question that the stagnation pressure is, is, is 10 bar, whereas the atmospheric pressure can be taken as 1 bar. So working that all out, I get 2,000 for the momentum term plus 2,073 for the pressure term, so 2,273 meters per second of uh, specific impulse. And this calculation tends to confirm uh, what I said earlier about the momentum term tending to be much larger than the pressure term, at least in this case. Finally, we've been asked to work out the mass flow so this is a trivial calculation. Because we know what thrust we're trying to get, we can rearrange the equation of a specific impulse in order to get to work out mass flow for that thrust. Finally, the area calculation. Well, as I say, we know the area parameter, but now we know as well, we've just worked out the mass flow. So we can rearrange the area parameter in order to give us uh, the actual value for the area at the nozzle exit. So that concludes the first part of the lecture, where we've looked at designing rocket engines to achieve a desired specific impulse. In the next part of the lecture, we're going to compare different fuels for use in rocket engines.